It's called the Democratic Republic of Congo, but opponents of the president say he's anything but, as Joseph Kabila is accused of plotting to cling to power. Can his African neighbors and the rest of the world help pull this fractured country back from the brink? This is Inside Story. Hello, a warm welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. A large-scale crisis could be just around the corner in the Democratic Republic of Congo. That is the warning from UN Human Rights Chief Zaid Raad al Hussein after anti-government protests turned into riots. Police say 32 people were killed in fighting in the capital, Kinshasa, on Monday and Tuesday and blame protesters for inciting the violence. The opposition disputes the number of dead and says the total is more than 100. The crowds initially came out on the streets to demonstrate against an election delay, which some suspect is a plot by President Joseph Kabila to stay in power beyond his two-term limit, which runs out in December. Kabila's mandate is at an end. Whether it was election in 2006 or the second election in 2011 or the third election, he is looking to falsify things left and right so that he can hang on power forever, as if Congo was his personal kingdom. Late on Thursday, Lambert Mende from the Ministry of Information spoke to the media. Here's some of what he said. The government of the Republic Democratic of Congo the government of the DRC bluntly condemns those acts of violence and we decided to impose order in response. We also welcome the general prosecutor's announcement that he's determined to arrest and engage the full judicial process against those responsible for this violence, violence which cannot be justified in any way. We are also open to a political agreement during and after dialogue. After the dialogue, we anticipate setting up a follow-up committee as long as things go well. And even those who haven't participated in this process before are welcome to contribute their ideas and research for an agreement. The problems we've had so far have been disagreements over wording. But nonetheless, work will continue to go on to form an agreement, even in a country that has as many problems as we do. Finally, I don't think the UN's high authorities can fairly say that the DRC and its authorities are causing conflict. On the contrary, if you look around, you'll see that the DRC's leaders are the least conflict-prone of any leaders of this part of the world. Well, let's talk more about this now uh, with our guests in Geneva. We have Scott Campbell. He is the Africa Section Chief for the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And in New York, we have Jason Stearns, the director of the Congo Research Group at New York University. Good to have you both with us, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Scott Campbell, let me start with you. As someone who, who represents the UN, and there are 20,000 uh, uh, or at least or thousands of UN peacekeepers in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. How, how concerned are you about stability in the country right now with everything that is going on there and what many people say are attempts by the government to uh, continually delay this election process? Mm. Thank you. No, we're extremely concerned and, and both about what took place uh, earlier this week and, uh, and what may be to come. I mean, this week we saw an excessive use of force uh, by the police, uh, backed by members of the Presidential Guard. This resulted in a large number of killings, uh, some reports more than 50, we're still confirming numbers. Uh, a large number of arrests as well, uh, reports of more than 300, uh, and a large number of people uh, injured, including by, uh, by bullet. So we're very, very concerned uh, for what's just taken place uh, in Kinshasa, um, but also for what may be to come as in a, a very tense political uh, climate uh, and the lack of an inclusive dialogue, um, we feel that the situation could spiral uh, further, further downwards. And importantly, uh, with a past pattern of people not being held account uh, for such serious human rights violations, we fear that a, a cycle of impunity uh, could fuel uh, further violence. Jason Stearns, is that how you see it? What, what, what do you, what's your view of what is happening there? I think it's extremely worrying the, to provide a little bit of the political context. We're really in uncharted territory here. I think it's easy for people to see pictures of people on the streets of Kinshasa throwing rocks uh, and dead bodies in the streets and think that this somehow is business as usual, however unfortunate it may be. 
this is really new in the DRC, and that's because we're headed towards the end of President Joseph Kabila's uh, term. Constitutionally, he has to stand down uh, by the end of the year, December 20th. And what we're really seeing playing out is uh, the succession battle, the battle for Joseph Kabila's succession. And initially, that was taking place in the corridors of power, behind closed doors, uh, in this dialogue that Scott was talking about. And now, because the dialogue is not inclusive, because they were not able to reach a, an agreement, and because it's now very clear that elections will not take place this year, uh, it's got taken to the streets. And so it's really uncertain where things will go, but the stakes are extremely high. You have uh, Joseph Kabila, you have everybody around him who stands to lose power, and you have the opposition determined to re determined to enforce the constitution and to get to power. And so it's really, it's really, I think, uh, extremely volatile and precarious situation. Is there a potential for widespread conflict in your view, then, Jason Stearns? Uh, I think it's uh, it's it's very difficult to say. I, I think at the moment, what's most likely is there to be ongoing protests in the streets of Kinshasa. Uh, there is no indication, as in other African countries where this is this is taking place, that there could be a split in security forces. Often, what you have is an interplay between the streets and security forces, and from Burkina Faso to Egypt to Tunisia, what really brings about mass violence is then when the security forces then uh, join in. But uh, even the streets of Kinshasa could get much bloodier. And I think we have to understand that this will have repercussions on the east of the country, which is a, a thousand miles away from Kinshasa, but where there are more than 70 different armed groups active. And these armed groups are extremely aware of the political situation. Some of them have links to politicians. And the political crisis in Kinshasa will have inevitably consequences on the situation there, where at the moment more than two million people are displaced. Scott Campbell, what kind of leverage does the international community have over the DRC government? And do you believe they should be uh, applying some of it? Oh, I think there's quite a bit of leverage. The international community, uh, actors in Europe, in the West, as well as in Asia, China, and others, have uh, a great deal of economic interest uh, in, uh, in the DRC. Uh, and this goes in parallel with, with political interests. So I think there's, there's quite a bit of leverage that can be, uh, can be used and should be used. Um, I think some uh, member states have imposed and are considering uh, individual sanctions uh, against those responsible for serious human rights violations and blocking uh, progress uh, towards a peaceful democratic uh, transition. I think that's something to be, to be considered. Um, and uh, there, are many, there are many other uh, tools, I think, at the disposition uh, of the international community that should be, uh, should be put to use. Well, we're going to take some time to broaden this discussion out a little bit now because, as we've said, opponents of President Joseph Kabila blame the violence on his efforts to hold on to power beyond his constitutional term limit, either by delaying elections or revising the constitution. As other African leaders have done, all of the countries you can see here currently have heads of government who have been in power for at least 15 years. Togo will likely join that list as President Fore Nasingbe's third term is meant to last until 2020. Same with Pierre Nkurunziza, president of Burundi, who successfully changed the constitution and won a third term last year. In both cases, their attempts to cling to power led to mass protests and riots in which people were killed. At least 24,000 people fled Burundi in the chaos that surrounded the president's campaign and election victory. In a unique contrast, two million Rwandans petitioned parliament to allow Paul Kagame to run for a third term in 2017. And some African countries, including Gambia, Djibouti and Chad, don't have term limits at all. So um, if I could come back to you, uh, Jason Stearns, then, what is it about African leaders uh, that leads to so many of them wanting to hold on to power? Is it, is it the arrogance of, of power? Is it the old, the old thing about power, power corrupting? What, what, what's behind this, do you think? I think it's a natural instinct by people in power to stay in power as long as they can. I think it's more a question of uh, whether you have the, a strong enough institutional framework to prevent that from happening. And I think what you've seen in many of these African countries is a weak institutional framework, uh, not enough checks and balances. Uh, but also, I think, a, a battle emerging over these various issues. You saw, for example, in Senegal, uh, an attempt um, uh, by Abdoulaye Wad to stay in power fail. Same thing in Burkina Faso as well. And the Congo, I would say, is actually a little bit different than these other African countries. Uh, it, it is going to be very difficult for Joseph Kabila to change the constitution to stay in power. In fact, he's floated a test balloon several times, had some of his 
associates come out in the public and discuss this idea. And it's met with so much opposition across the board from the Catholic Church to the international community, to civil society, that it's going to be extremely difficult for him uh, to do that. And in fact, he's never publicly said he wants to do that. And so I think that um, what you're seeing across the African continent is a battle over these various issues. And I wouldn't think, I wouldn't say this is a, an unchanging or somehow immutable situation. I think it's dynamic and it's in flux. And the Congo is a prime case for that battle at the moment. Scott Campbell, it's been said by, by uh, Kabila's critics that uh, the only reason he's trying to delay these uh, elections as much as he can is because uh, at this point in time, he's not able to change the constitution uh, in the DRC, uh, uh, as some of some of the other African leaders have had managed to do. And if he was in a position to do that, if he had the power and the votes to do that in parliament, he would do that. What, what do you say to that? Well, I'd, I'd also want to pick up on what Jason was, was just saying. I think there are a number of examples where constitutions uh, have been respected, uh, and there have been two-term limits respected as well, in, in West Africa in particular, in addition to what, what Jason mentioned. Uh, we've seen recent, uh, recent elections in, uh, in Guinea, in Benin, upcoming elections in Liberia. Um, there are a number of good examples, I think, in particular in West Africa, that hopefully will have a, a contagious effect on leaders in Central Africa and elsewhere, uh, where leaders have been much more reluctant to, uh, to step down. I think the other factor that's important to consider in Congo is the economic situation. And this is uh, the socioeconomic situation, um, massive unemployment, poverty. Uh, there's been a sense among the population uh, that there, there hasn't been a, a, a dividend, a peace dividend, uh, if you will. Uh, and so there's a great deal of frustration um, with the, um, the two mandates uh, that President Kabila has been uh, in power. And thus, there is uh, quite a bit of, of latent pent-up uh, energy um, that I think we're seeing now in the form of, of street protests. So this is something I think very important to, uh, to consider uh, looking for a solution going forward. Well, the DRC shares borders with nine, nine other African countries, uh, Scott Campbell, and it's been argued that a, an implosion uh, in this country could spark instability uh, in its neighbors, as it has done in the past. Is that, a, is that a concern that you share? Very much so. We've seen in the past, I mean, in the so-called uh, African war uh, in the mid, uh, mid to late 90s, uh, where we saw six or, or seven or perhaps more armies involved uh, in the conflict in the DRC, um, there's a, a distinct possibility that other countries uh, could become involved uh, again, as they have in the past. The, the borders, of course, uh, to these countries were, were drawn up you know, more than 100 years ago uh, in Europe. Uh, there are ethnic ties uh, amongst peoples living on both sides uh, of the border. Um, there are political interests also that go across the border. So there is a, a distinct uh, concern that, that we have uh, that a, a degrading situation in the Congo uh, could bleed over the borders uh, into the neighboring countries. Jason Stearns, there has been an argument made um in support of, of, uh, uh, of what the government is doing here, in that they, they say there are genuine uh, reasons for needing to uh, delay these elections. It is a country of 79 million people, uh, not, not a great uh, infrastructure, uh, lots of uh, new people that have, uh, young voters that have, that have come into voting age who are not registered. All of that needs to be dealt with, and it is going to take a long time in a country like the DRC. Is, is that a... Um, a genuine, I mean, w what do you say to that view? Is, is that something that needs to be looked at? Absolutely. I think the government's right in saying it takes a long time to prepare elections. The question is why they didn't do so. We've had five years to prepare these elections. It's true that the electoral register needs to be revised, uh, that new voters need to be enrolled, that the voters who are dead need to be purged from the voter rolls. This is all true. Um, if you look, however, at the past five years, you've seen a lot of foot dragging on the part of the government. And the reason that we're now incapable of holding elections on time in the Congo is because the government has not uh, allowed that to happen. And so yes, there have been delays regarding to political turmoil and military turmoil in the East, but really that's not an excuse. For example, the, the budget of the Electoral Commission uh, that was scheduled, to, was scheduled by Parliament was never provided to the Electoral Commission until this year. And so they didn't have any money to work with. There was no money to, to register voters. It's very clear that the government has intended to delay the elections from the beginning. And so I, I, I think that the substance of that argument is correct, but that just puts more burden 
uh, on the government to say why they didn't prepare uh, for this ahead of time. Scott Campbell, is Kabila simply trying to hold on to power here? Well, I would say, you know, elections are, are never perfect, whether they're held uh, in, in Africa, in Europe, in the West, in, in Asia. There are always imperfections in elections, and one can never have the perfect conditions. I would point to the, uh, the north of DRC, to the Central African Republic, however, uh, where two years, uh, after two years of transition from an extremely um, bloody conflict there, the country was able to pull itself together with support from the international community and hold largely peaceful elections. Um, if you can do it in the Central African Republic two years after such a grave conflict, um, it can certainly be done in the DRC. Conditions will never be perfect, but I think what's important is that the elections are held in the most reasonable short amount of time uh, and also that the president does clearly indicate publicly uh, that he won't, be, he won't be standing in those elections. Jason Stearns, do you think uh, Kabila can survive these protests? And if he doesn't, uh, do you fear that worse may be to come in the DRC? I think that it's going to be very, if, if he sees the temptation to think that uh, the government can muscle their way through this, I think it's, we're entering an extremely volatile phase. I think it's very important for there to be a political agreement. It's clear now, unfortunately, that elections will not be held this year. Um, Despite the violation of the Constitution that, that 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 creates, all parties do need to sit together around a table to decide what happens next. And I think what happens next needs to be a new electoral timetable that is as brief and short as possible uh, um, to hold elections as soon as possible. Um, it, the dialogue needs to be inclusive. And I think a key factor and one of the reasons for these protests is that the two main opposition figures, Etienne Chisekedi and Moïse Katumbi, are not participating in the dialogue. In fact, Moïse Katumbi has an arrest warrant um, uh, over his head that many consider to be dubious or on, uh, made on a dubious base. Uh, and so he's in exile. He can't actually come to the Congo to participate in the dialogue. And so these are not uh, conditions that are conducive to a peaceful settlement of the crisis. So uh, as Scott was saying, President Kabila can make, could, could make a huge uh, step forward by saying publicly that he will not stand in the next elections, by saying that Elections will be held as soon as possible, uh, and that is possible next year, and also by dropping uh, political charges, politically motivated charges against his opponents. Scott Campbell, you agree with that? Uh, generally, yes. And I, I would add to it just that I think uh, also what would uh, greatly assist in diffusing the situation uh, would be an announcement from the government uh, that they will investigate uh, the very serious human rights violations that have taken place uh, over the, the course of uh, this week in Kinshasa, and the perpetrators will be held to account, and that they launch a serious, impartial, independent investigation into what has taken place. Furthermore, that they provide, as Jason was saying, a, a more conducive environment to dialogue, uh, an inclusive dialogue. And that would include um, releasing political prisoners, um, ceasing to arrest um, uh, members of uh, political opposition organizations ceasing to arrest journalists, seeking to, ceasing to uh, intimidate uh, and harass uh, members of, of the opposition. Um, there are a number of very uh, important measures, I think, that the, the government can take uh, in terms of the human rights environment to create the environment where you can really have dialogue, talk, uh, and confidence building. Uh, between the opposition and the government to find a political solution and as quickly as possible. Jason Stearns, do you think there is enough of a, of a will from the international community to, to really apply pressure on uh, the DRC? Um, and do you think perhaps that they, they're, they're not willing to because they're afraid of what might happen, that it could backfire on them? I think that there's a lot of risk aversity in the international community. There's no doubt about that. The problem the Congo has is that despite its, uh, its the enormous humanitarian catastrophe that's been unfolding there in recent years, that it's on the margins of geopolitics. And so while the largest peacekeeping mission in the world is deployed there, um, there are few great powers in the world who really think that the Congo is worth it to expend significant political capital. And the Congolese know that. And so they keep on calling their bluff. Uh, the elections in 2011 were rigged. Uh, everybody who observed the elections, almost everybody said as much. But business went on as usual afterwards. And so I think now um, it's really a matter of making key members of the international community, especially the United States, Europe, but also regional countries who have an enormous sway 
uh, over the government to, to understand the stakes of this. I think that the Congo could really go off the rails, uh, maybe not today or tomorrow, but in the, in the coming years, if some sort of political com compromise is not hashed out uh, to, to, have, to hold elections as soon as possible. And so um, the United States has led the way by imposing sanctions on one individual so far. I think that more can be done by the U.S. and the European Union. But the African Union in particular, I think, has an important role to play. They are the facilitators of the dialogue. They've named the former prime minister of Togo, Edem Kojo, uh, as the facilitator of the dialogue. And yet you've seen a, a real lack of willingness by African countries even to come out and say that Kabila must step down at the end of the year or that he must announce that he will not change the constitution. And this despite um, numerous treaties and conventions from the African Union saying exactly that. And so I think that South Africa, Angola, uh, the African Union, Tanzania, these are countries that have a lot of, uh, of political capital with the Congolese government. They should use it. Yeah, let's put that to Scott Campbell then. When we talk there about the international community, but what about regional players like the African Union? What more could they uh, be doing here? Well, I think the African Union uh, should be teaming up with the UN, and we're seeing some of that uh, happening hopefully uh, later this week uh, in New York. Um, but from the UN perspective, I, I think much more needs to be done. Uh, the UN is stepping up its advocacy. There have been statements by uh, the Secretary General, by the Security Council, uh, today by the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I think it's very important that more is done by the UN and in conjunction with the, the African Union in terms of the messaging, both public uh, and private, um, to the leaders both within the government uh, and the political opposition uh, to find a, a political solution. But within the framework that, that we mentioned earlier, one where uh, we have a truly inclusive dialogue and where, where the, the rights of all are, are respected. I would just mention, it, it, it's very eerie, I was looking at a, a report um, that the United Nations produced five years ago, uh, also in the, the context of, uh, uh, of elections, presidential elections, the 2011 elections that were mentioned earlier. earlier. And it's eerie looking back and seeing history repeating itself, but where the UN at the time documented 33 people killed um, by the police, by the Republican Guard, a large number of individuals also uh, arrested, harassment, detention of the opposition, of journalists, of civil society members, and unfortunately, since that time in 2011, uh, no one being held to account. And thus, not surprising in some ways that we see history repeating itself. Jason Stearns, we haven't heard much from uh, Joseph Kabila himself in all of this. Why do you think that is? That's a very good point. Uh, he is not of the nature to say a lot. He is a taciturn and reclusive character. That is, that's just simply who Joseph Kabila is. There was a statement read on national television yesterday from Joseph Kabila, although he didn't appear on national television himself. And so he has, by a proxy, said, uh, called for peace and calm while also accusing the opposition of rabble rousing. Um, I think that uh, this is also not just a matter of his character, however, but also sort of the political institutions that exist. Joseph Kabila has built his career on um, striking deals within the political elites. Appealing to the masses is not something that he likes to do or even thinks he needs to do, because power in the Congo is held, is, is, uh, is stitched together through deals amongst politicians at the, at the highest level. And I think that may be changing. I mean, I think what you're seeing in the streets is fatigue by the people for that status quo. And so I think as much as the situation looks bad now in the Congo, we're also, this is, to a certain extent, an optimistic moment, a moment where you could really see change in the Congo, where you're seeing the government struggle to push through a third term as, as has happened elsewhere. And, and, you, and the vibrancy of Congolese political culture come to fore. It's not always nice. In fact, it's looked very ugly over the past couple of days. But behind that, I think, well, there's a dynamic that, um, that should be reinforced. And so the last thing that we should do is say, oh, my goodness, this is just another country that's in chaos and nothing can be done about it. This is actually a new situation. And there are positive forces at work here that need to be reinforced. All right. And on that note, we're going to have to leave it. Scott Campbell and Jason Stearns, thanks very much for being on Inside Story. And thank you for watching. As always, you can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hazem Seeker and the whole team here in Doha. Bye for now.